Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum. Selamat pagi. Selamat sejahtera. Apa khabar semua this morning? Bagus. Now, let's continue to explore and learn more about gelatinization. For gelatinization to occur, what is the main thing we must have? Water. So gelatinization is also known as water mediated process. Without water, then you don't get gelatinization. If you heat the dry starch, the dry starch contain around maybe 10 to 12 percent, sometimes slightly higher, moisture. With that amount of moisture or water content, if you heat the starch, what would happen? Dry, dry powder, 12% moisture. If you heat, if you heat up, what will happen? Will, will it gelatinize? Because the glass transition is actually above the room temperature. Okay? So if you heat up the dry powder, the dry starch powder, and you increase the temperature, you don't see a, a proper gelatinization. Uh, probably you will see the starch will get burned. Yeah? Which means that it will start to decompose. It will start to decompose, it just burn. So we need some uh, amount of water. Okay? So when we talk about gelatinization, the, we always look at whether the gelatinization occurs in the presence of excess water or limited water. Okay? When, we, when we say excess water, it means that the water content is above 60%. So that is roughly the amount of water for complete gelatinization to occur. In the presence of excess water content, more than 60%, and we increase the temperature above the gelatinization temperature of the starch, and we allow sufficient time, then the starch would gelatinize completely, cook completely. How do we know? Then, of course, in the previous lecture, we say maybe we can look under the microscope. There is no more multis cross. Or when we, in the, the SC instrument, uh, we can see the, uh, you know, the complete, uh, the peak um, from beginning, from the onset to the end. So we can see the whole peak. So that's how we can determine complete gelatinization. So in order to get complete gelatinization, we need to have more than 60% water and um, above, we, we hit above the gelatinization temperature and we get sufficient time. So temperature, combination of temperature, time and water. What happens if the moisture content is less than 60%? Can we get complete gelatinization? Maybe at higher, we have to cook at, or we have to, you know, cook at longer, uh, sorry, higher temperature and longer time. But if the moisture content is even lower, so maybe if we use very high temperature and very long time, still maybe we don't get enough, or we don't get, we don't get complete gelatinization. If we don't get complete gelatinization, how do we know? Um, well, maybe we can take some sample, look under the microscope. And we can see, when you get complete gelatinization, all the starch granule actually will be disrupted, burst. Because it will swell to the maximum, and, and finally, it will psh, burst. So we look under the microscope, you don't see any granular structure anymore. So that's one indication of complete gelatinization. But when you get incomplete gelatinization, so you take some sample and look under the microscope, 
probably you will see some uh, granular structure, but maybe not, you know, in the proper shape. Maybe it's already deformed, but still you can see some kind of granular structure. Or sometimes the, the term that we use in starch science, uh, we use to describe the distorted granular structure. We we use a term ghost, ghost granule, ghost. You know? uh, we call it ghost granule, granule hantu lah. You know because it looks like all form of shape, uh, a scary shape. <laughs> so that's one way. We look under the microscope. We can see deformed uh, granular structure, or sometimes we call it ghost granule. Okay. Anything. Uh, when when we carry out gelatinization below 60%, then we can say that is the gelatinization. This kind of this type of gelatinization happens under limited amount of water. So we would we would not get complete gelatinization, and this will actually will give a different properties to the product. And now this slide, I'm going to talk about the mechanism. Because now we have excess moisture and limited moisture, or excess water and limited water, the mechanism also will be different. Remember, we start with a granule in a native form, and we know that the now we know now the starch granule is in the semi-crystalline uh, form. It has about thirty to forty percent semi uh, thirty to forty percent crystalline phase in the granule. So. Now we add water, we increase the temperature. And the amylopectin molecules in the granule form the crystalline phase. Whereas the amylose in the native granule form the amorphous phase. So there are two domains or two different phases here. Crystalline, which is mainly the amylopectin and the amylose. And now we add water, the granule will absorb water, we increase the temperature. So let's say um, in the excess moisture condition, more than 60% water. So initially, the, when the granule absorb water, excess water, the amorphous region or domain or phase in the granule because amorphous you can imagine the molecules are sort of uh, not in a proper ordered arrangement they are sort of random so they are quite loose they are quite loose structure unlike crystalline crystal usually the molecules or the atoms are arranged very close together compact so it's more difficult for the crystalline phase to absorb water molecules easily. But the amorphous is more kind of loose and less condensed, less compact. So it can water can sort of be absorbed easier. So the amorphous phase absorb water, and this has the effect to swell the granule, and as a con as a cons uh, consequence of swelling of the amorphous region in the granule, it will start to destabilize, destabilize the crystalline region. Because remember, they are intermingled. Yeah? They are alternate layer of crystalline lamella, amorphous lamella, and the bulk amorphous. And when the bulk amorphous region is now being destabilized because it absorbs water and the granule now start to swell, the, the next uh, sequence of event will be it will now destabilize the crystalline region. Okay, so now the melt the crystalline region now will start to melt. Will start to melt. Provided we continue to supply enough heat 
for sufficient long, sufficiently long time. So that is the. This is only actually one of the mechanism proposed by the scientists to explain the process of gelatinization in excess water. But not everyone, not every scientist agree with this mechanism. So therefore, when you read a book uh, or any article about the mechanism of starch gelatinization, you might find some differences. But let's settle with this mechanism for our purpose. Okay. So this in excess water, what will happen now? Or how the mechanism would, would, be, would differ in limited moisture, water content, less than 60%. This part actually explains the limited moisture or limited water content. Now, if we have less water or very low water content, maybe just about 30% or you know, 20%, now this small, lower amount of, of water uh, would not be enough to destabilize the amorphous phase. So what would happen at low moisture content, we need a higher temperature and longer heating time so that when we supply enough energy, it will be enough uh, because this crystalline phase now would require higher amount of energy to melt the crystal. So that is why when, when, uh, when we have less than 60% water, you cannot use the same amount of time, the same uh, uh, temperature and the same time. The cooking time and temperature would have to change in order to achieve the same level of gelatinization. But in a real food system, it's not that simple. In a real food system, we always have uh, water, the starch, and other ingredients. So these other ingredients would complicate the mechanism. Uh, when we have sugar, when we have fat, when we have salt, and other things. So. For example, if we add sugar, the sugar molecules is, uh, themselves are very hydrophilic. So they also bind water. So now the sugar will compete for the water molecules with starch. And because water, as sugar is a smaller molecules, they will be able to bind water better than the larger molecules. Because starch, initially in a granular form, so is the water probably will have to penetrate the granule before it can be absorbed by the amorphous granule. That's for the, uh, the amorphous region in the granule. But now if you have sugar in the solution, the sugar now is in a free form. So, and they are free, more open compared to the granule structure. So they will bind water easier and faster than the granule. So more water will be bound by the sugar, now less water would be available for the, for, the, for the starch granule. So in this situation, when we add more sugar, less water would be available for the starch. So the mechanism now would be similar to, would be uh, the mechanism of low moisture gelatinization now would would operate, would, pre would predominate. Yeah? Yes? Mm -hmm. um, it will involve some destabilization of amorphous even in a limited moisture. But then we need to increase the temperature we need to allow longer time. Okay, we need to allow longer time. But even but if the moisture content is very very low, then this process cannot be sort of uh, 
cannot be cannot be completed. So we cannot destabilize the amorphous region completely, and therefore we cannot melt the amylopectin region completely. So we don't get complete gelatinization. We don't get full swelling of the granule. So if the granule does not swell fully, uh, then most likely it won't also uh, rupture fully. We, can, we will see some pictures to show clearly the difference between in the uh, low moisture and high moisture system, or low water and high water content. Excess water. Think of a product where we have a lot of water. Porridge. Yeah. Soup, like Campbell soup. Those in the Campbell soup in the, in the can. What else? Yeah. So those are excess moisture. Limited moisture or limit, limited water? Huh? Crackers, yes. Very low moisture. Bread. Candy. Oh, yeah. I find in the exam or in the test, sometimes students give example. Uh, it is a discourse. Yeah? But when I look at the example, they say, say candy. What kind of candy? Like those, the soft candy, yes, they, they, they starch. But uh, sometimes they give product like uh, what? Uh, there's no starch inside. <laughs> so when you give example, give an appropriate example. Yeah? yeah, something like bread, cookies, those are made from uh, contain starch. But these are a good example of low moisture or limited moisture or limited water uh, product. So in those products, like bread, if you take the sample, look under the microscope, surely you will see some granular structure. Because in bread, the, the amount of water is, is limited. Okay? Even you put in the oven at 200 over degrees Celsius, still you don't get complete gelatinization. So the theory here is based on so-called water mediated. The process is, the medium here is the water. So this is a real data from um, this experiment from this paper. So you can download this paper from Science Direct. Uh, volume 36 is a page number 1998. This uh, very clearly demonstrate the difference between weximes, weximes high in amylopectin. Potato, this normal potato, 25% amylo, 75% amylopectin. Hylon, 7. This is a specific name for a special hybrid of high amylose starch. Hylon 7 is a special hybrid of high amylose maize starch, corn. Yeah? So high amylopectin, high amylose, and normal starch in the middle. Very beautiful picture to illustrate the difference in the during the process of gelatinization and the effect the effect of the amylose and amylopectin ratio. This is uh, without heating, room temperature. So you can see this is a granular structure. The original before heating. Now we heat to 40 degrees Celsius. 40 degrees Celsius is usually still slightly below the onset of gelatinization for most type of starch. Usually most starch will start to swell the gelatinization, the onset pemulaan there, probably around 60 on and above. So 40 is Approaching, approaching, but not yet. But you can see for vaccine mass containing high amount of amylopectin, already 
then it starts to swell a bit. But normal starch, potato, compare, maybe a little bit. High lawn. You don't see much uh, difference. Meaning that it's still like, you know, uh, like the initial size. So this is high amylose. Now, we hit to 70 now. 70 degree is probably above, already above, past the onset of gelatinization. So you can see where uh, waxy maize granule already, already burst actually. You don't see a proper granular form. And potato at this temperature already probably reached the maximum swelling. Just like balloon, maximum. You blow a little bit more, but this maximum. And what about uh, hyalon? Probably yeah, a little, little bit, maybe 10%. Or maybe can't tell also from the picture. But if it's swell, maybe about 10, 20% the most. And 100 degrees Celsius already well above the gelatinization temperatures for most starches. And you can see waxy maize, this even at higher magnification actually. You can see, you know, already burst, potato already burst, but high, high lawn, maybe about to start. You can see now some swelling, but still a long way to go. So, picture tells a thousand story. Can you tell a thousand story from this picture? <laughs> okay, maybe a few. What can we say? What can we say now? What can we conclude from this picture? Okay, anyone? Uh, anyone volunteer? Volunteer? Yeah, uh, chicken. Louder chicken. Need higher temperature. Um, yeah. What about hmm, higher temperature? Yeah. Um, okay. Or we, if we put it the other way around, if we hit the starch now, we, we subject this, we expose the starch sample now to the same temperature, right? Then we can say that the waxy mass would swell fastest, fastest, right? Compared to normal potato and high amylose and, and hyalon 7. That's probably one point we can, uh, we can make. Then um, we can also see that hyalon 7 appears to be the least, um, swell the least. In terms of swelling capacity, or to the extent of swelling, tahap, swelling of the granule, uh, hyalon 7 actually swell the least, the le or shows the least swelling, the lowest. So what can now, how do we relate now to the ratio of, or to the amount of amylose and amylopectin here? So we can say that hyalon 7 containing the highest amount of amylose hyalon 7 containing the highest amount of amylose would swell would show a lowest tendency to swell. 
Okay, you can put it that way compared to amylo, uh, compared to wax, waxy mass containing high amylose, high amount of amylopectin. So we can say that we can say if we have more amylose in the granule, the reason why it cannot swell fast, uh, why it cannot swell uh, faster compared to potato and waxy mass because the amylose actually give a strength give a strength to the granule. It holds the structure of the granule and it would, uh, it would uh, provide so like a reinforce, reinforce, menguatkan the, the granule so it become more difficult for the granule to swell. So if, if you want the high amylose starch to swell, you have to supply uh, enough heat so you have to increase the temperature sometimes maybe even above 100 degrees Celsius. So you have to heat up under pressure, maybe in the auto cliff. So because you cannot, at atmospheric pressure, the highest you can get is 100. So you have to uh, put under, you have to use like auto cliff or high pressure cooker. Then only you can fully gelatinize the high amylo starch. If you use a normal atmospheric pressure cooking, 100 degrees Celsius maximum, then maybe you want to uh, you want to extend the cooking time much longer in order to reach a full gelatinization. And you must have enough water, more than 60%. But for waxy mess, it's very easy to cook. So any starch containing high amount of amylopectin it's easier to cook because it can swell faster. But then, when, it, when the granule reach the maximum swelling, it will reach the, the, the maximum swelling faster compared to normal starch and high amylose starch. But the granule is also very fragile. So it can, uh, it can swell very fast, so the viscosity will increase very fast, but then the granule will break up and you will lose the viscosity also very fast. So the, the curve will be something like very steep, then psh, also very steep. Whereas potato, normal starch, would increase the viscosity maybe rather slowly, gradually, then reach the maximum, then the granule will start to break or disintegrate, and it will lose the viscosity, but rather slowly or gradually, more gradually compared to maximase. And this one, maybe you don't even see, you know, the, the increase in viscosity. So this can be, well, uh, before that, yeah. So to see the process of, uh, yeah, Ishan. Question, mm. how about the amylose which uh, leaks out from the granule? Oh yeah, during this process, ah uh, yeah, maybe this picture. Uh, during, during when, when the granules swell, there are a few things uh, actually happen. Uh, when we add iodine, then we can see the, because only the amylose component will bind the iodine, then will give a dark blue color, whereas amylopectin uh, will show like a more like purplish, uh, red, uh, brownish uh, color. So we can differentiate where is amylose, where is amylopectin in the granule during the gelatinization. So initially, we can see like this, very dark, okay? But when the starch granule start to rupture, so we can see the, the continuous phase here is uh, blue in color, which means we have actually amylose leach out from the granule into the con surrounding, into the continuous phase. Whereas amylopectin, the, the purplish color, that is the amylopectin component, which apparently still uh, being, uh, still remain in the granule because they are big molecules, they cannot easily leach out from the granule. But amylose being a linear molecule, the short, especially the short chain, amylose can leach out into the surrounding. So this is what so what we have now is 
uh, a starch uh, uh, paste, yeah, a starch paste containing uh, uh, the amylose and amylopectin, maybe some granular fragment, and this is what we refer to as starch goose. Okay, the starch, sorry, the ghost granule, the ghost granule. Okay. Now, um, we can follow the changes in the, during gelatinization by looking at the microscope, looking at the Maltese cross, but we can also see the manifestation of gelatinization, how it manifests physically. So the manifest one of the physical changes during gelatinization is the increase in viscosity. So we can measure the increase in viscosity by using uh, instrument like RVA. This number Farana. Farana has experience uh, using RVA or maybe visco emilograph, but RVA rapid visco analyzer. So we can measure the viscosity increase during the process, which is uh, quite easy to do. So we can start say, uh, this graph start from 55. If we plot start uh, from room temperature, then you, do, you, you see only a flat line. So we start from 55 when the granules start to maybe a little bit, swell a little bit. So, and this is a temperature. Usually the temperature, the, the instrument can be programmed to heat at a constant heating rate, maybe um, a few degrees per minute. Then um, usually we heat up until 95. So 95 degrees, oops, Lihun, <laughs> you sleepy? <laughs> Uh, so, uh, the temperature program, usually we start from say around room, room temperature or maybe around 40 degrees Celsius. If, if you know the, the gelatinization, the onset of gelatinization say at, at 60, then maybe we can, stay, we can start maybe around 40. We don't have to start from room temperature because otherwise we have to wait you know, quite long. Then this is the onset. Onset means you can see in the curve there is an inflection. Then yeah. you can see it starts to increase. That is the inflection point. So we can draw a tangent. So that intersect the intersect of the two tangent that will give you the onset of gelatinization. So at this point the granule will start to swell a bit. And maybe we don't get many amylose to leach out yet. Then increase a little bit more, then maybe you get start to see some you know, shorter amylose chain start to diffuse out, and more and more. And until the, the granule reach the maximum capacity the maximum swelling capacity. And now, this is at the weakest, the most fragile moment in the life of the granule. <laughs> Just like human being, very, the, your weakest moment is when you are emotionally fragile. That's when the time some people, if they are not strong, they can jump from the Penang Bridge. So, <laughs> yeah, be careful. And here, you can see more, most of the amylose actually will sort of leach out, diffuse out from the granule. So when, just now in the previous slide, we can see by putting the iodine, we can see the, the separation of the amylose and amylopectin. And this, start to burst from fragments. How fast they will reach this point 
would depend on the amount of uh, heat, the rate of heating, the shear. In fact, also the types of ingredients we have in the system. If we have a lot of fat, the fat actually will give some kind of protective effect on the granule. It kind of lub lubric lubrication effect also. So they won't uh, get fragmented easily. So all this actually will delay, would delay the would delay the changes in the viscosity. So we can do actually experiment yeah, to see. So it will uh, decrease in viscosity and form more and more fragments. So now at this point, we have a starch paste. We have a starch paste, and the starch paste always contain. A mixture of molecular of amylose and amylopectin in the in the in the solution in the salt, plus the granules fragment, plus the granule fragments. That is a starch paste. Okay, that is why the whole process is called pasting. Pasting, p a s t i n g. Or in Bahasa, pempesan. Okay. If, if you feel that it's a bit funny to pronounce pempesan, then you can say pasting. And until 95. So the program will start at 95. Then, usually, we will hold. There's a holding period at 95, maybe for 5 minutes or sometimes 15 minutes. And we continue to monitor the viscosity changes. 95 degree fix, but we continue to heat for another you know, 5 minutes, 10 minutes or 15 minutes. And we can see now whether the viscosity would continue to decrease or we just sort of Maintain. Uh, this is one one way we can see the stability of the the of the starch in terms of ability of the paste of the starch to maintain the viscosity. So this is what we call the shear stability because we continue to shear the sample. So we can compare one starch with another starch in terms of what would be their final viscosity after this at, at high temperature. So from there you can see okay, what kind of suitable starch you want to use if you want to use, if you want to get this kind of viscosity in the product. Okay. When you continue to heat, more and more of the starch fragments now will become even you know, smaller and smaller. And this actually will change the rheological property or the viscosity of the starch paste. If you heat for a longer time and higher temperature, for example, in the retort, you can even get some of the starch molecules, the amylose and amylopectin, start to degrade, break down. The, the long chain of the amylopectin or amylose can even start to break down or depolymerize, become a shorter chain. So from a big chain, big polymer, become smaller polymer or smaller chain. Lower, high molecular weight become low molecular weight. And if this happens, you will get the viscosity to e re reduce even more. Okay, So this is all about the stability of the starch during cooking. And that will affect the final viscosity that you will get in the product. Okay. So this is a type of instrument. Um, in the old days, this is a very famous. You will find in, in many, maybe still, even now, in some old flour mill or in old bakery, uh, you can find this instrument. This is called Brabender Emilograph. Uh, usually made in German by Germany, German manufacturer. So you have the the bowl here where you put the starch, put 
prepare the starch slurry and put in the bowl. Then you have a heating mechanism and you have the, the pedal or the mixer. So this is uh, from uh, this uh, to, to rotate the pedal, then you can measure the torque. Then from the torque, you translate that into, you know, the shear stress, shear rate, then you can calculate the viscosity. But um, the viscosity, when we, use, when we use this instrument, the viscosity is expressed in this unit, BU, Brabender unit, or RVA unit. Or we can also change to a proper SI unit, centi poise. Eh? So the curve that you saw just now, the plot of viscosity against temperature and against time, this is called pasting curve. Pasting curve. So what can we get from the pasting curve? So this is how it looks like. Viscosity again, time and again temperature. And the red line, the red line represent the heating program, the temperature program. So we start by increasing the temperature linearly, linearly. So we fix the heating rate. Then we reach the maximum temperature around 95. Then we hold. This holding time can be you know, minutes, few minutes, as long as 15 minutes to see the stability of the starch, whether the viscosity would increase further or decrease. Then after that, we cool down. So we always have heating up, holding, cooling down. During the cooling down, or during the heating up, we want to see the gelatinization characteristic of the starch. During the holding, we want to see the stability characteristic of the starch. Stability here means whether it can hold the viscosity. Hold the viscosity means whatever vis maximum viscosity it has reached, whether it can maintain at that viscosity or drop. It will never increase. It will drop. And the cooling uh, period now is to look at retrogradation. So in one testing study, we can look at gelatinization, retrogradation, and the stability of the starch. Yeah? Yes, usually involve shearing. Okay? Huh? Any? Not clear? Yeah. Uh, you can use gelatinization and pasting uh, like interchangeably. So how do you differentiate between these two terms? Oh. Pasting involves the whole event. The whole event from here up to maybe here during the holding period. And during this process, the process from onset of swelling until the starch lose its viscosity when it start to the granules start to burst so then the viscosity will start to drop oops so the whole event is called pasting because it involves usually when we say pasting we will we will we will also involve some kind of uh, some form of uh, shear that would uh, assist the gelatinization process okay so the whole, when we say gelatinization, it will involve the sequence of events, starting from absorption of water, uh, the granules start to swell, then the amylose will st uh, start to diffuse out from the granule, then it will reach the maximum viscosity, then after that it will start to, the granule will start to burst. So the whole event is called gelatinization. Okay? Pasting, 
Pasting is the whole event involving the temperature as well as uh, the shear that we put in into the system. So in order to paste, in order to form a starch paste, the starch has to go under to undergo the starch has to undergo process of gelatinization. Okay, I know some book differentiate between pasting and gelatinization, but it's actually involved both. Gelatinization must take place in order for the pasting to, in order to achieve the pasting, to paste the starch. Okay, the starch paste consists of the the amylose and amylopectin plus the fragmented granule. So in order to get all this, the starch has to go complete gelatinization. And the temperature of gelatinization always, not a single value, not a single temperature, but a range of temperature. We start from here until the maximum has reached the peak. Sorry, reach the maximum swelling. So it reach the maximum peak viscosity here. So the range will be from this temperature up to that temperature. See, always the range. Okay. If we give a single value, so we, we usually refer to the onset. If we say that the gelatinization of potato starch is about 60 degree, so means the onset is 60 degree. But if we uh, usually it's better to give the whole range, say from 60 to 65 or 70. So meaning at 70, the potato starch has reached the maximum swelling capacity. Beyond that temperature, we know that the granule will start to uh, disintegrate or to rupture, to burst, and will lose, start to lose the viscosity. Okay? So the whole event of pasting, I would say, starting from the onset here until we get this, the hot paste viscosity here, the viscosity, hot paste because we are holding at 95 here. So this is also known as hot paste viscosity. So the whole thing here, we have a starch paste. When we start to cool down, the viscosity will start to increase again. From this point onwards, from this point onwards, that is the process of retro, retro, retro retrogradation, or in this case, uh, we call it setback. Yeah. Setback. So the next graph actually will show you the various parameters that characterize the gelatinization, uh, characterize the pasting, as well as the retrogradation part okay and this uh, during the holding period we can measure the peak viscosity and this point is called this is called trough viscosity and will go, give you the breakdown will give you a measure of the stability of the starch i will say more about this graph in the next uh, lecture yeah? so we stop here yeah Shen. Uh, viscosity of the starch is contributed both by amylose. Either the swelling or the leaching. Yeah, both. The swelling of the granule, the, leach, the amylose that leach out to the surrounding, as well as the granule itself, whether the swollen granule or the fragmented granule also, everything would contribute to the viscosity of the paste. Yeah? Okay. Mm.